Well, it's good to have everyone here, and we appreciate each one putting their mind in the midst of a busy week to some study of God's Word. And since we mentioned the study of God's Word, I'd like to call your attention to a verse that gets quoted around here quite a bit. That's 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The American Standard Version 1901 will have that version, that verse read this way, give diligence. So the King James says study in the American Standard and possibly other versions says give diligence. The idea we would best use here is be studious. And the disposition of mind and viewpoint that is necessary to be in a studious mindset. It takes diligence and dedication and desire. So when you approach any subject, then you ought to have that view. But how much more so when it comes to the study of God's infallible holy word? That word that we take so for granted in this country wouldn't be on this earth except that God specially decided throughout time, exactly the right time, how the various writers inspired of the Holy Spirit to set down his will. And when you look at the totality of the Bible, you look at the totality of God's will. When you approach the Bible, it should not be approached as a human book. It is, in truth, the Word of God, in which the will of God is revealed to man for man's good and ultimate salvation through Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. That basically sums up what the Bible message is. We're urged in both the Old and New Testaments constantly one way or the other, can't be missed, to study, study, study. To expose ourselves to the Word of God and meditate on it, to examine ourselves a lot of it, to learn how to do these things. And so Paul is telling this young preacher, you already had to know enough to preach because you can't teach what you don't know. Told him to study. Now, we know from Paul's writing to Timothy that he had a miraculous gift for laying on the apostles' hands, which would have been Paul. And he says, though, through the laying on of my hand. Yet it would not take the place of him studying the scriptures. So he was to give diligence. He was to be studious. And he was to do that to show himself approved unto God. Sometimes we fail to realize that our life on earth is our time to show God that we want to be approved of him. And it's impossible to be approved of him if we don't study his word. And it's impossible to engage in studying and gleaning from the words of the Bible, the truth of God for us, if we don't have the right disposition of mind. We're taught to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our soul. We're taught that if we continue in God's word, that we will be his disciple and the truth will make us free, John 8, 31 and 32. So there's never a time in one way or the other that the faithful child of God, seeing that faith comes by hearing the word of God, there it is again, Romans 10, 17. That one's mind doesn't dwell on some aspect of the truth and its application to our lives. So study to show thyself approved unto whom? Unto God. And we're workmen. Workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. Ashamed before whom? God. Nobody can say they won't be ashamed before God if they think they can serve God and not know his word. 
Hosea said to the people of old, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, I'm quite sure that they didn't have that knowledge because they didn't want to have it. If you really desire something, you really want something, you strive to get it. And what's interesting about God's word, he's done all that's necessary that we couldn't do for ourselves in providing it for us. He also has made us so that we could understand language and that we could think, we could reason, we could know the meaning of words, and we could make application of those words to our life. So study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And then here's the next part, rightly dividing the word of truth. And Denominations fail to get that. I might mention that the American Standard 1901 says handling aright the words of truth. Well, words of truth carried us back to John 8, 30, 31, or where Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So when we consider 2 Timothy 2, 15, we recognize a very important part of why people, many people, some even in the church, don't understand a lot about the Bible. First of all, they don't have the right attitude toward it. And I might mention in here, along with the right attitude, they don't approach it as the authoritative will of God, given especially to man to lead God and direct him in the ways of righteousness. Righteousness being right doing. person wants to be right with God, he must be righteous. Can't be righteous without his proper knowledge of the word of God. Handling a right means that there could be a wrong way to handle it. If you can handle it the way you want to, it wouldn't be any use saying there's a right way to handle it. That implies there's a wrong way. And, of course, there may be many wrong ways. There's only one right way. And thus we must have the proper holy disposition of mind and approaching it and wanting to learn that right way. Of course, and we sing this sometimes with the little folks on our singing time with them one Sunday evening a month, and we will sing uh, old and new, and we'll say some little something about that, emphasizing that the Bible has two parts to it. And then we'll sing the songs of the new, the, the names of the uh, of the New Testament books. Well, that's a lot of folks uh, would do well to realize you learn things better and retain it by learning it to a tune. So people can't say from memory the New Testament books, the names of them. Well, just learn that little song. And uh, after a while, you'll forget the tune, you'll know the books, and that's what you're after anyway. You can do the same thing with the Old Testament. But the main thing is to realize why there are 66 books. It's all put together in one book. Two major divisions, Old Testament and New Testament. 39 in the Old, 27 in the New. And when we begin to study that, we see that this whole volume made up of 66 books and divided into two sections, 39 of the Old Testament, 27 in the New, that it covers the three great dispensations of time, actually three great religions, by which man has served God in worship. And that first one being the patriarchal age, patriarch meaning father, thus it's the father through period. And it covers from actually down to the giving of the law, Genesis 1-1, if you want to start there, to the giving of the law of Moses on Mount Sinai to the children of Israel. So it's Genesis 1-1 down to Exodus 20. Now, there's no use expecting to learn all about Judaism from the patriarchal age. There was no written law. Well, then why do we have what's written about it? Because Moses, who lived 
under both times, he made the transition from patriarchy over to being under the law of Moses. What was through him, God gave the law. Moses wrote by inspiration, of course, as every one of the writers of the Bible did, of the Holy Spirit. He was born along to infallibly record what God wanted him to record. So when you read about the beginning and all about the patriarchal age and the people that make it up, Moses is the one that wrote it. But again, because it inspired, we'll say simply God wrote it. During that time period, men approached God, and it was the head of the family that acted as the priest and the prophet. And he offered worship by sacrifice for his family and himself. Everything was pretty much done on family unit. Basically, moral law guided everybody, except as God revealed things. And he did so by speaking to the patriarchs and so on. This is a time when there was a, a time, I should say, in which all men believed in God. But it was also the time that men began to forsake God. This period lasted some 2,500 years. Then, we, of course, we come to the Mosaical Age, a period of 1,500 years. And it covered from as far as the Bible's concerned, from Exodus chapter 20 all the way down to the cross, where Colossians 2.14 tells us that the law was taken out of the way, was nailed to his cross. Now, some people might say, well, why do you say the church started on the day of Pentecost? And I say that primarily because the Bible teaches it. But the Christian dispensation begins there. Now you say, well, I thought the law was nailed to the cross. This is about 50 days later, isn't it? Yes. But it's like any law. Law may be passed now in a legislative body, but it won't go into effect until January 1st, 2024. And while the law ended at the cross, the force of the New Testament system did not begin to the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ in Acts chapter 2. And we may very well call Acts 2 the hub of the Bible. Before Acts 2, everything pertaining to the kingdom or the house of God or the church is referred to as in the future. But after Acts chapter 2, the church is referred to in reality. Now, that's not hard to see when you read Acts 2, especially when you see the Lord added to the church daily such you should be saved, Acts 2 verse 47. So the Christian dispensation started, and when, it's go when is it going to end? Well, it's going to end when the world ends. When, this when these elements that make up the material realm, time and so forth, disappear by the authority of God as manifested in his word. When I approach the Bible, thus I see three great religions, the patriarchy, the mosaical dispensation by which the children of Israel approach God, worshiping through the Levitical priesthood, and it's interesting to note that that law was never expected to be passed on down to those after that dispensation ended. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verses 1 through 5, Moses is restating the law to the children of Israel before they went over in the land of promise led by Joshua. said, this law was not given to our fathers. But it was given to us, even us, who are all of us alive here this day. Now, Gentiles, uncircumcised Gentiles, could become circumcised and choose to keep the law. And, of course, they would be proselytes. 
But the Jew never was commissioned to go into all the world and preach Judaism to every creature. They were to be exemplary by living the law and keep God's name alive before the nations. And of course, in studying the Old Testament, we realized they didn't. But when we come down to the New Testament, we find then that the will of heaven is through the authority of Christ. Jesus said, all authority and power hath been given unto me in heaven and earth, Matthew 28, verse 18. Thus, we're not under Moses. That dispensation ended. We're not under patriarchy. That dispensation is long gone. We're under the authority of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have passages, another one that gets quoted around spring quite a bit, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. So we act according to the authority of the Lord. The authority of the Lord is manifested in the will of the Lord. The will of the Lord is found in the word of the Lord, and we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, for when they needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling aright, the word of truth. The truth is in the word. If you don't know the word, you don't know the truth. That leaves you wide open for any lie told. Thus, a constant effort to think on the truth and to keep it fresh in our mind. And as David said, that he hid his word, God's word in his heart. He might not sin against him. Now, when you look at the New Testament, you can break it down to the biographical section, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke had to do with very life of Christ. So basically, we call all four of them a biographical section, but they're not two bi true biographies. You might put them all together, together and, and call them simply the life of Christ. We would do well to realize, though, that in speaking of what is taught Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that that doesn't mean that's the beginning of the Lord. That's just his earthly ministry. He existed in eternity. According to John, in John 1, where he makes it clear in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten of the, begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we're under authority to Christ, and that's why he would say, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. Word that I've spoken, these saying, shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. So we have then the books of the life of Christ, the biographical type approach. And when we come into the rest of the book, we have, or the rest of the New Testament, we have Acts as the historical section. Longest section is the letter section. And then we come down to the prophetical section, which is Revelation. Everything from Romans down through Jude are letters written to individuals or to churches. And when we close out, of course, the Bible, we are closing out with a warning not to add to or take away from the words and books of this prophecy. If any man adds to or takes away from, then the plague we put upon him for doing so. Now, the Bible is full of material that says don't mess with God's word. You don't establish his authority, but you ascertain his authority. How do you do it? You learn how language works. You learn the elements of communication. And you realize God did not bypass them or our ways of understanding when he communicated his will to us. So it becomes our duty to study, to be studious, to give diligence, have the right attitude, and to pursue it in the right division of the word that we'll be pleasing to God and not be ashamed, have to stand ashamed before him, and that we can know the word of truth and know that we know it. These things, and I could break it down even further, we can break down the Old Testament into the various sections. Even the New Testament and the letters, we can break down those to it. We won't do it now. 
but rather this is simply called a systematic approach to understanding the Bible. A lot of people will never understand the Bible because they jump into it like uh, a hogwood in a mud hole, and uh, you can't find anything that way. And if the mud's deep enough, you may not see much of the hog. So if people need to learn. Uh, man understands better the systematic approach to study any material. Always uh, been interesting to me that when a medical doctor or one who wants to be a medical doctor enters in the medical school, the whole first year of medical school, he's in gross anatomy. He's learning the muscles. He's learning the bones and skeletons, nerve system, lymph system, all those things. Learn them. Well, how do you learn all that? Think of all that. It's systematically broken down, and it all fits. And so it is with the Word of God. If you don't learn these particular matters, the Bible will forever be a closed book, or at least you won't get as much out of it as you could. So in this midweek Bible study, Important to understand these very, we're just touching the hem of the garment, very important fundamentals of study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divided, the word of truth. Thank you.